It's my great pleasure to introduce Camilo Delelis from the Institute for Advanced Study, who will talk about the center manifold. The topic that I'm going to um, explain to you is actually uh, quite complicated, and it, it took me a lot of time to uh, figure out how I could actually convey the basic ideas uh, in, in this piece of mathematics without um, entering into many uh, technicalities. I hope I, had, I have succeeded in that. So we are going to actually look at area minimizing graphs. First of all, let me set up a little bit of notation. So we will use this notation for the graph of a function u. So this will be the set of points x, u of x, such that x is in a certain domain f. And f will usually be some subdomain of Rn. And for our purposes, u from some omega, which com contains f, into Rn will be always a Lipschitz function. Yes? Right bigger. Right bigger, OK. Good. OK, so um, first of all, let us make a very simple observation. So uh, com omega contains f, sorry. Very well. So first of all, we will always look at uh, functions which have a certain precise Lipschitz bound. So first of all, we will use this notation for the Lipschitz constant. And secondly, in, 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 all, in, all, in all our assumptions, the Lipschitz constant of u will be either bounded by 1 or bounded by 2, something like that. OK? So it's not, it's not so important, actually. One could figure out better constants. I mean, the important point is that it's always under control with, 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 with some uniform bound. OK? And the first observation that we, uh, the first observation that we want to, um, to make uh, in the lecture notes, it's actually uh, stated in a form of a lemma. And it's not a lemma that I'm going to prove, because it's very elementary, is that if we have a Lipschitz function and we tilt the coordinates slightly, so not too much. In the new system of coordinates, the graph of the Lipschitz function is still the graph of a Lipschitz function. OK? So if we tilt the coordinates slightly, graph of u over some set f will remain, so I, I will use actually this notation for the new coordinates, will be actually the graph of a new functions in the new system of coordinates. So here I have my original coordinates and maybe some Lipschitz function. And then here I have a new system of coordinates. OK, so this would be like x and y. Here I have a new system of coordinates, x prime and y prime, and in the new system of coordinates, this will remain the graph of a new Lipschitz function, which we call u prime. So if I take a point over here, and I go down over here perpendicularly, in the new system of coordinates, this will be the point x prime, u prime of x prime. OK, and it's a simple observation that the Lipschitz constant of u prime is actually less or equal than the Lipschitz constant of u plus some universal constant c times the modulus of the uh, uh, matrix whose rotation, I mean, of, of, of the rotational matrix, which is giving you the coordinate transformation from x prime y prime to x y. So the coordinates x prime, y prime, and then the relation that x prime, y prime is equal to a x y. OK? I mean, this, this as long as you have this uniform bound of the Lipschitz constant, which is like 1 or 2. OK? So this is nothing but by saying that since the Lipschitz function, I mean, the Lipschitz constant of, of, of uh, I mean, if, if you had a nice, uh, domain, the Lipschitz constant is nothing but the maximum slope of the function. And if you look at it in the new system of, of coordinates, the maximum slope of the function can be at most the maximum slope in the original system of coordinates plus the angle that the new system of coordinates forms with the old system of coordinates. 
uh, Hilbert-Schmidt norm for a matrix, uh, operator norm. It, I mean, it's, it's, it's a matrix, so it's, it's an element of a finite dimensional space. So pretty much any norm you use, actually, is going to make this uh, statement happy. But OK, so let's say in general when we, I mean, in general when I have a matrix and I put these two, uh, uh, and I mean, and I look at norm at, of, of the matrix, I'm always thinking about the Hilbert-Schmidt norm if I'm not saying anything else. So the Hilbert-Schmidt norm meaning the sum of the squares of the entries of the matrix, and then you take the square root of that. Sorry? Um, right. Sorry. Exactly, so the angle, sorry, I forgot to subtract the identity. Good point. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I have to change actually that in the lecture notes. Very well, okay, so uh, thank you very much for the observation. So now, let me give you a definition. So I will consider area minimizing graphs. OK, so I will define area minimizing Lipschitz graphs by the following uh, uh, definition. So first of all, the Lipschitz constant of u is going to be less or equal than 2. OK, and then so here there will be some, some, some constant c0, which depends on m, of, of, on, on m and n, and it's positive. OK, and so for every system of coordinates, with this rotation matrix, which is close to the identity by this constant C0, so and So if u prime, so if graph of u prime omega prime is the uh, um, uh, description of our surface in that system of coordinates, okay, then what I want is that the n-dimensional volume of the graph of any competitor V in omega prime is actually bigger or equal than the n-dimensional volume of the graph um, of U prime in omega prime. And this is for every Lipschitz map V such that um, the place where v and u prime differ, right, is compactly contained into my omega prime. Okay, and now of course this u is from omega into Rm, and we actually prescribe that the domain omega is open, uh, Rn. Okay, so this means that every time that I make a perturbation, which is a new Lipschitz graph, but I allow my system of coordinates to be slightly changed, so then the competitor must have strictly uh, a bigger volume. And what is this m-dimensional volume that I'm using? So this m-dimensional volume is the usual m-dimensional volume of, of, of a surface. I mean, it might be described as the Hausdorff m-dimensional measure of the, um, graph as a subset of the product space. And we have a classical formula for this graph, for the area of this graph, which I'm now going to write down explicitly because it will be extremely useful in a lot of our uh, uh, future computations. So the m-dimensional volume 
of the graph of u over some set omega. Uh, and actually, in this case, this omega does not have to be necessarily uh, 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 an open set. Actually, we can make this computation on any Borel set. OK, so what is this? This, is, this has an explicit formula, so it's the integral over omega. And then I'm going to take the square root. So here I have 1 plus modulus of du squared. And then I have the sum. And in this sum, I have all minors um, of order 2 times 2. So and I, have, I have to take the determinant of these minors and then square it. OK, so m alpha beta of the u is a, or is any, k times k minor. And our convention is that modulus of alpha, where alpha is a multi-index, is exactly the length of the multi-index. So this means alpha is a collection of numbers, which are going to be the rows that I'm selecting uh, uh, in, my, uh, uh, in, in the matrix representation of the derivative of u. Beta is going to be the columns. And here I'm selecting k equal modulus of alpha rows, and k equal modulus of alpha equal modulus of beta uh, um, uh, lines. And uh, then I take the determinant and square it. So this complicated, this complicated formula, of course, becomes rather easy when you have a function which is taking value uh, uh, in the real line. Because when the function is taking value on the real line, this term over here drops. And you only have the square root of 1 plus modulus of gradient of u squared. Okay? So this formula gives you the Hausdorff measure of the portion of the graph which is lying over uh, uh, the set f. OK, so it's, it's, it's a well-known fact that area minimizing graphs with a sufficiently small constant are actually, re are actually real analytic. So this is a fact. And uh, we are going to see, actually, at least a partial proof of this. So, if u is a Lipschitz area minimizing graph, with sufficiently small constant, then u is real analytic. Actually, in co-dimension 1, so if, you, if, if your graph is taking value into r, into the real line, you don't need any restriction on the Lipschitz constant. And there are several ways of doing this. So the most classical way would be, if you are, for instance, in co-dimension 1, to write down a system of partial di uh, 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 a single partial differential equation for your uh, uh, minimizer, just by writing down the euler lagrange equation, using the De Georgi-Nash theorem to infer that actually the derivative is uh, Hölder continuous, and then use Schauder estimates to infer sort of further regularity. Okay, and then okay, so it's a classical fact that uh, that, that the, the equation that you get, which is uh, an elliptic equation and which is nonlinear, but it is real analytic in the in the uh, uh, gradient, uh, the second derivative, and in u, uh, if it has, uh, I mean, any smooth solution, then will be real analytic. Uh, in higher co-dimension, actually, the bound on the Lipschitz constant is important. So there are examples of solutions of the Euler-Lagrange equations. And these examples are actually due to Osserman and to Lozum and Osserman, which are just Lipschitz, but don't gain any further regularity. So they're not going to be C1 alpha, in fact. Of course, as soon as you have Hölder regularity for the derivative, you can apply Schauder estimates. So if you have C1 alpha regularity, uh, even in the higher dimensional case, uh, you can carry on the usual program and then get to real analyticity. Okay. So we're not going to follow that. Um, I mean, we're not going to follow this plan. 
But we are going to prove another theorem of the Georgi in this particular case. So it's, it's not the most general version of this theorem of the Georgi, because the most general version works without assuming that the surface minimizer is a graph. But it's particularly interesting to see how the proof actually works in the graph case. And then the general case is kind of more technical uh, um, generalization for which you have, anyway, references uh, in, the, in the lecture notes. OK, so here's then the first theorem that we will prove in this lecture. I mean, uh, roughly two of the lectures will take to, be, to, to prove this theorem over here. So this is the Georges theorem for area minimizing graphs. And here is the statement. So for every alpha between 0 and 1, there exists constants. And these constants, which are epsilon 0 and c, are going to depend on alpha the dimension and the co-dimension of the domain. Such that if um, u from the ball of radius 1 into Rn is a, an area minimizing Lipschitz graph, with constant less or equal than 1, then actually in half the ball, u is a C1 alpha function. And the Hölder norm, I mean the Hölder semi-norm of the derivative of the function Oh, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. I, I, I need another assumption, sorry. So if it is a Lipschitz graph and very important, one quantity which will be called the excess, which is the volume of the graph minus the volume of the disk so which we, we will denote by omega m. So omega m is the Lebesgue measure of the one-dimensional ball in Rm. OK, so if this one is less than epsilon 0, then as I was saying, the, the surface is actually C1 alpha and the Hölder semi-norm of the derivative of u in the ball of radius 1 half is controlled by this constant that I gave you and a square root of this e, which we will often call the excess. OK, so you notice over here that I'm taking the volume of the graph, which is sitting over the unit disk, and I'm subtracting the volume of the disk. So this is, so this quantity tells you how much the graph exceeds the area of the disk. Of course, since it's covering the disk, it must have area which is at least the area of the disk. And if this excess were equal to zero, it's always a good thing to check whether you know, the theorem is at least trivially true when you have a trivial assumption. If the excess is equal to zero, then the only possibility is that the function is completely flat. And if the function is completely flat, actually the Hölder norm of the derivative is just equal to zero because the derivative is constant. I mean, the derivative is actually identically equal to zero in this case. OK? So you see that instead of assuming that the Lipschitz constant is small, because here I'm, I'm saying actually that the Lipschitz constant is less or equal than one, I'm assuming in a sense that the oscillation of the tangent planes is not too large in an, in an integral sense, right? So this is more kind of an integral uh, uh, control. OK. So that's the Georgi's theorem. And let me 
I mean, before going on to state the other theorem, which is actually the real main goal of the lectures, and which is also an illustration of a much more general theorem in a very simple setting. So let me just make the following uh, remark. So this is also left as an exercise to you, but it's certainly a more difficult exercise than this uh, change of variables. Okay, so uh, uh, we're going to do the same. So uh, we're going to do the following. So assume this denotes the tangent space to the graph of the function u, which is Lipschitz and therefore differentiable almost everywhere. I mean, when I'm actually ignoring the domain of the graph, I mean, when I'm in this notation, when I'm ignoring the domain of the function, it means the domain does not play such a big role. Huh? Sometimes I will just drop it. Okay, the tangent space comes with a very natural orientation, right? So if you take a standard basis E1, EM, standard basis of RM, and if you then take EM plus one, till EM plus N standard basis of the other factor, Okay, then you can write down explicitly a basis for your tangent space, and the basis for your tangent space is going to, I'm, I'm going to denote it in the following way. So it's going to be EI plus the differential at the point P of F at the point EI, uh, I mean, uh, uh, computed on the vector EI, and this writing over here is nothing but the sum for k equal one to n, and here you will have df k dx i, of course at the point p. Wait, what is f? Uh, sorry? Oh, f is a function. Uh, and the function there is called u. Um, yeah, let me call it f actually. Okay, and here, I'm putting the E M plus K vector, okay? So that's what, I'm, what, that's what I, I understand as this sum. So this sum is going to be a vector in R M plus N. And as I take I, which is running between one and M, I actually get a basis, an oriented basis of my uh, um, uh, tangent to the uh, Lipschitz graph, which gives you a canonical orientation of the tangent, and of course this canonical orientation of the tangent is kind of uh, uh, the only orientation which is compatible with the idea that if the function is identically equal to zero, and you are completely fat, right? So the canonical basis becomes E1, EM of your tangent space, right? So just the basis that we have fixed of the, uh, 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 of, of, of the first factor. Okay, very good. So now if I give a name, VK to these, uh, um, okay, VI to these vectors. Okay, I can use multilinear algebra and this K vector, so I take the wedge and then I normalize by the modulus and I'm going to tell you what is the modulus of the, uh, uh, of the of the m vector in a couple of seconds. Okay, so this is what we will call t vector p graph of u. So this is the m, the unit m vector which is orienting 
your tangent plane, okay? And what is this object over here? So this object over here has a very uh, neat geometric interpretation. This object over here, you can define it as the m-dimensional volume of the, parallel, uh, of the parallelogram, which is spanned by V1, Vm. That's one possible definition. But you can actually endow the space of m vectors with a scalar product, the scalar product being the following. So if you have two simples m vector, the scalar product between them is simply the square root of the determinant of the matrix that you obtain by taking the scalar products of the various vectors. And then this m-dimensional volume is actually nothing but the norm which is associated to this scalar product that you can define on all m vectors. So I'm defining it only on the simple m vectors, but you can actually extend it uh, uh, by multilinearity uh, to all m vectors. Okay, very good. So now, there is an interesting uh, uh, formula. So let me give you this as a proposition. Maybe it's actually a lemma in the lecture notes. So take a Lipschitz graph. It's just a computation, so you don't need actually any bound on the Lipschitz norm. It's, it's not going to be an estimate. Okay, then the m-dimensional volume of the graph of u over omega minus the measure of omega, okay, which we know by a simple geometric observation is actually a positive number, right? Just because we have said uh, 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 you're covering omega, so you only have hope of getting at, at least as much area as omega. So this is actually one half, and then you have to take the integral over the graph u omega, and here you take the distance between the m vector, which is tangent to the graph of u, and the horizontal m vector. So for which we will use often this notation, squared. Okay, and here you're integrating in the Hausdorff, uh, in the Hausdorff measure. Do you have a question? Is yeah. Uh, no, 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 sorry, no, 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 sorry, sorry, no, no. I got, I got actually mixed up. No, this color product does not have any square root. Sorry, uh, so thank you for pointing this out. Uh, I got mixed up, so the, Modulus of the m vector, right, is of course the square root of the scalar product of the m vector with itself. Okay, so of course the square root you only you 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 only take it when you're interested in computing this guy. Yeah. Yes. Okay, and so what is this pi zero uh, uh, with, a vec with a vector on top? So this is the notation that we will use for the standard m vector which is orienting, uh, which is orienting your horizontal plane. Okay, so pi zero is equal to E1 wedge EM. Okay, so now, this gives you a sort of explanation why in the estimate, I mean in the George's estimate of the C alpha norm of the derivative of u, you had a square root of this excess, okay? So if you interpret it in this way, right, this quantity, this excess, is a kind of square of an L2 norm, right? So this looks like the square of an L2 norm. Okay, so now one 
of course, you can observe one thing. If you are a Lipschitz graph, as soon as the left hand side is equal to 0, the right hand side is equal to 0, and vice versa, because you have this identity. But if you have a general surface, the thing on the left might be equal to 0, and the thing on the right might be actually positive. So if a surface gamma, so, so if a surface gamma, uh, 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 let's say, if a surface sigma, a general surface sigma, has no boundary in the cylinder omega times Rn, right, which is kind of the situation in which we are working if we have a graph. So if we have a graph, the situation is something like this. Right, so the boundary of the surface is all lying on the lateral surface of the cylinder. So you don't see any boundary inside. So in a more general situation in which the surface sigma has no boundary in omega times Rn, it's going to be a multiple cover of what you have down, right? But you might have more than one, than one sheet, okay? So you might have, for instance, several sheets. Okay, then if you have several sheets, the right hand side, for instance, really measures how much these sheets are horizontal, right? So the right hand side would be equal to zero if these three sheets, in the example, they're all flat. But on the other hand, the left hand side is specific of assuming that you have one single sheet because the left hand side is going to be, the volume is going to be three times the volume of the horizontal projection. Then you subtract the horizontal projection and you just have something positive, okay? So, you might wonder whether there is a general De Giorgi type statement which tells you, even if I don't assume that it is a graph, and so the surface might be multiple sheeted, if I assume that the right hand side, the excess written with the moduli is small, can I conclude that my surface comes, of course, not with a single graph with C1 alpha estimates, but with a bunch of graphs? Right, so with 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 a, with a sheeting, so of of uh, of uh, uh, a certain number of graphs, which will depend somehow on the total area of the surface to start with, which are all C one alpha, okay. And I mean, this is not a a a you know, it's not a generalization for the sake of generalization. So if you were looking at general uh, of a, at the theory of general surfaces which are minimizing the area for which a priori you don't know that there is a graphical description at any point, right? Because they might be very rough. This is the kind of theorem you're actually looking for. Because since you don't have any a priori assumption that you're locally graphical, right? So you want to work in the uh, most general situation. And now here it comes a very interesting point. So in co-dimension one, this sheeting theorem is actually correct. So in co-dimension one, if I have a general surface and I tell you that this quantity is small over a certain cylinder, and I have a bound on the area of the surface, then if this quantity is sufficiently small, then I know in half of the cylinder, I'm actually a certain number of sheets, which are C1 alpha. And they are all separate graphs, which don't intersect. So in co-dimension one, this kind of sheeting version of the George's theorem is correct but in higher co-dimension is completely incorrect. So it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a famous example which is due to Federer and based on the computation of Wirtinger, and I can actually, I cannot give you the proof, but if you take the, the following surface, so you take the complex uh, 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 if you take the, uh, the complex space C2, which you identify with R4, and you take the following surface, so you take Z square uh, W square equal to Z to the power 3, okay? So this is what is usually called a, a, an algebraic variety in, 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 in C2. Well, locally, this is an, an oriented area minimizing surface. So in the sense that it's an oriented surface, it has a singular point in the origin, but if you sort of discard this singular point, it is an oriented surface such that if you replace a portion of this surface with any competitor, the competitor has to, go, has, uh, has to have larger area, okay? It is 
very flat in the neighborhood of the origin in this sense. So you see, if I were allowed locally, or I, I am allowed, of course, locally, if z is different from 0, to take a square root, and then on top of every z, I see somehow two copies, and I will see z to the power 3 over 2, so I will have very flat tangents. And this quantity will become actually very small. Now, we will see that the, the, the quantity that we have to look at is not really this one, but it's, it's average, so if you want, the quantity which is really relevant for the epsilon regularity theory is actually the average of this. So I have to normalize this by the uh, uh, um, volume of the horizontal projection. But even if I normalize by the volume of the horizontal projection, these, the tangents to this surface will be uniformly close to uh, the horizontal tangent when I take uh, uh, z very small. And nonetheless, in the neighborhood of the origin, I'm not able to say that there are two sheets which are C1 alpha, right? So if I take, a, I mean, if I make a turn around zero, I will pass from one branch of the square root to the other branch of the square root. And my surface is always connected, actually. Whereas if I had a, a cheating theorem uh, 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 like the one I'm hoping uh, uh, in the generalization of the Georges theorem, I would have to have two separate sheets which are disconnected, okay? So and this actually has given big, big headaches in the regularity theory of minima surfaces for uh, a lot of time. But there is a fundamental theorem by Almgren, which is actually, uh, I mean, which I cannot uh, quote in its generality, but for which I can give you at least a kind of uh, 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 an idea. So. So the theorem, the theorem of Almgren just says that if this quantity over here is small, so let us call it ball phase E. So if E is small and the mass and the total area of the surface is un under control, so if E is small for, not for a graph, I mean, but, but, but for a general surface, so if I replace this graph of U with sigma, and the volume of sigma is under control, OK, then up to some small errors, my surface is a cover of the horizontal uh, 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 omega. So is a, say, a Q cover, where Q just gives you the number of points that I meet on top of my horizontal point at most places, is a Q cover. And although, actually, I, I might have a singularity at the origin, as it happens in this case, however, if I take the average of the sheets, the average of the sheets is more regular than the whole object itself. Excuse me? Yes? Uh, so now, now that you did away the graph and you put sigma, then you are uh, taking it as actually some cone or some cylinder or something? Because yes, yes. So uh, I'm taking it in the cylinder and I'm assuming, and I'm assuming it has no boundary in the cylinder, yes. Yes, sorry that this is going to be a little bit vague, but I mean, uh, in a few seconds we actually arrive at a new theorem which is going to, to have a very precise statement. So, uh, I mean, all of this discussion is trying to summarize things that you can actually read on surveys. So for what is the reason why this theorem is important in the regularity theory and so on. But then, I mean, in, in, in like five minutes we arrive at a precise theorem on graphs, and then we will focus on that somehow. And then uh, uh, my definitions will become precise again. So, and, and, and the average, of the sheets is more regular in the following sense. There is an approximation, so there exists an efficient 
approximation, which is C3 beta for some positive beta. Now, efficient means the following. So this approximation, uh, 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 let us call it, uh, say, G. Then efficient means that the C2 alpha norm of the derivative of G, C2 alpha, uh, C2 beta, sorry. So not C beta like before, but two derivatives more. is actually bounded by a constant times this excess to the power 1 half. And in which sense this is an efficient approximation? This is an efficient appro approximation meaning the following. In every region, in every small region, you look at the separation between the, the, the two uh, uh, sort of uh, sheets which are over the region and which are kind of further away. And this approximation of the average sits in between. Okay, So it's an approximation of the average, meaning that at every scale, the maximal separation between the sheets that you have in your object is comparable to the distance between these sheets and this average. Okay. So under this definition, you could actually go back to the original situation of the Georgi and ask yourself, what happens if you have a single-valued graph? So if you have a single-valued graph, I'm telling you that in each region, your approximation of the average of the sheets has to have distance between the two uh, uh, sheets which are most further away among each other, which is uh, comparable, right? But that's only one sheet. So this, the distance between the, the sheets which are further away is exactly equal to zero. So in the case of a single sheet, your approximation has to be the single sheet everywhere. And if it has to be the single sheet everywhere, you actually conclude that your area minimizing graph is C3 beta. Okay? So let me quote this theorem. by Angren, and so as you see, it's just a baby version of a much more general situation, which is much more complicated to prove. But my hope is actually to give you good ideas on how you can actually uh, get the correct estimates in this simplified situation. So if, say as before, u from b1 into rm um, has Lipschitz constant, less or equal than 1, and graph of u is area minimizing, OK? So here at the beginning, I probably should have said that there exists two constant, epsilon 0, uh, which depends on m and n, then another constant c, which depends on m and n. And now the constant beta, which different from alpha, alpha in the Georgi's theorem was any con constant between 0 and 1. So you could, get, you could get almost C11 estimates. Now beta is just some small number. So these are all positive, such that if you have this u, which has Lipschitz constant less or equal than 1, and the graph of u is area minimizing, and which is the important assumption on the excess, so again, I write it as the volume of the graph of u minus the volume of the unit ball, which was omega m. So this has to be less than epsilon 0. And this is your excess e. OK, then In the ball of Ralph radius, the derivative of u has C2 beta estimates, which are controlled by a constant times this parameter e to the power 1 half. OK? So now, just, I mean, if you read the lecture notes, you, you will get a description of why somehow this theorem is important and so on. So let me just give, make two comments. So this is just a very, I mean, it's, it's a toy. It's a toy problem. I mean, once you have C1 alpha estimates, 
you can write down the PDE for your function u, and by shouted estimates, you can actually get that conclusion. Not only you can get that conclusion with C2 beta, but you get actually that conclusion with any derivative, okay? So the important point is that we will prove actually this theorem without using any shouted estimates, without using any PDE or any Euler-Lagrange equation for uh, your uh, critical point. In particular, because the interest of, the, of such a theorem, of having such a proof, is that when you are in the multi-sheeted situation and you cannot write down a PDE because you have an object which is not regular, okay, you will not be able to carry on the proof via shadow estimates of this. Okay? So the other comment is the following. So Andren's uh, uh, theorem in its full generality is a step of a, a major work that he did back in the 80s on the regularity of uh, oriented surfaces in co-dimension higher than one. Okay, so it was a monograph of a thousand pages. And this theorem over here, I mean, the, the, the bigger theorem, I mean, not this one, which is the corollary, the bigger theorem, which I sketched over there, has a 500 pages proof. Okay, so uh, uh, I, I have some, some, some works with uh, Emmanuel Espadaro in which we have recast this theory in a more man manageable framework. And in particular, we have a proof of this center manifold construction, which is around 50 pages. And it's much more flexible, meaning that people, meanwhile, uh, have picked up these constructions and they've proved other theorems, whereas Algren's uh, uh, paper was almost unused. So, for us, this observation that in the single sheeted situation you can get actually C3 beta estimates without writing uh, uh, any Schauder and without writing any uh, Euler Lagrange for your function u was the starting point to get this simplified uh, proof. Okay? And what I'm going to do is, in, in, in the proof of this, I'm actually following a, a small paper that I wrote with Emmanuel Spadaro before we actually completed our program of uh, recasting Algren's theory in a more manageable way, uh, uh, and which, in, in some sense, it's a small, self-contained uh, work in, in, in which you, um, um, you can give an idea of what are the key estimates in this central manifold construction. Now, in the paper that I have with Emanuele uh, uh, Spadaro, there is not the assumption that the function u, uh, that, 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 this, that the surface is a graph, okay? Rather than assuming that the surface is a graph, I'm actually only assuming this condition over here. Now, this condition over here, when, I mean, since I'm taking the whole volume and I'm subtracting the volume of the disk, if this one is very small, it's certainly telling you that you cannot have two complete sheets on top of the other guy, right? So it's a weaker theorem than the one of Algren, not only because I'm assuming that the, the, the surface is graphical, but also because I'm assuming that uh, uh, this quantity is small, which is, uh, uh, um, right. So now if I drop the graphicality assumption and then assume that this quantity is small, I will not be able in a first step uh, to say that the function is a graph, but it will be a graph of a single valued function. I mean, the surface will be a, the graph of a single valued function on a very big region at least, okay? So the, the paper with Emanuele is sort of in between the general theorem and this theorem over here, but it's still very, very uh, uh, elementary compared to the, um, uh, uh, to the uh, big Angren's theorem. Okay, so now what, are, what is the plan of the lecture? So the plan of the lecture is to give you first a proof of the Georgi, and then a proof of Algren in the, in the way I have defined uh, uh, things over there. Okay, and hopefully by the end of the second lecture tomorrow, or if not by the end of the second lecture tomorrow, not too deeply in the third lecture, we will be finished with the Georgi's theorem. And then, although we are not using shouted estimates, some of the conclusions of the Georgi's theorem will be functional to actually prove uh, uh, this theorem over here. Okay, so then, therefore from now on we focus on that theorem over there. Uh, no, on the theorem of the Georgi, which I stated before. And let me come to one first. Okay, so let me say proof of the Georgi's theorem. So this is just the start. We will do some preliminaries today. Okay, and so it's 
I mean, it will contain a lot of details, but th some things will be left uh, as an exercise, at least the things which are uh, doable. So first of all, we are going to define this excess, which is wrote down in a couple of uh, uh, very peculiar examples, uh, in a very general situation. So first of all, we will define the spherical excess for a surface sigma on a ball of radius r centered at p. So when I actually use this bold face ball, I'm, I'm meaning a ball in the product space rm times n. And with respect to a vector pi, a, an m vector pi, which is uh, orienting a certain m plane, so this excess is going to be the following quantity. It's going to be 1 divided by omega m r to the power m. So this is just the volume of the m-dimensional disk. And then here, I integrate over the ball of radius r centered at p intersected with sigma. OK, so the distance between the tangent to the surface sigma and your vector, I mean, your, your, your plane that you have fixed. OK, so in picture, this means you just have a fixed vector, a fixed plane, pi, a fixed m vector, and you are measuring the L2 norm of the angle that you do between this pi and this tangent. So here it's pi, so here's your surface, right? And what you're doing is, at each point here, you're taking the tangent plane, so this will be Tp sigma, this will look like this. Okay, and essentially, the, this, this, this uh, quantity over here, it tells you how big is the angle between this tangent plane and the vector, and the m vector pi that you have fixed. Oh, yeah, 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 yes, yeah, sorry, thanks, yeah. This, I want it to be q, right. And here, I'm integrating in the Hausdorff measure in q, thanks a lot. Yes. So p is the center of the ball, and I definitely don't want this point to be called p. I want it to be called q. Yes. Thanks. OK, then you see that I fixed an arbitrary vector pi. If I want to have an idea on the L2 oscillation of the tangents, I can actually optimize on all possible pi. OK, and this will be called the spherical excess. So if I'm not writing down here any plane, then it means I'm minimizing over all possible unit k vectors. OK, so that's the excess on a sphere or on a ball. And we will actually work often with this excess on the ball. And I want to make a very important remark, which is very elementary, but nonetheless, it's very important. So the problem has a certain scaling invariance which we will often take advantage of. So scaling invariance. OK, if I take a function u and I make the following transformation, I define the new function ur, and ur of y is going to be Um, where do I have it? Maybe over here? Uh, no. Mm. Yes. And you find a new function, u r, and this new function is 1 over r, and then you compute u of x plus r y, and you subtract u x. 
Okay, so you, you notice one thing, the Lipschitz constant of UR stays the same as the Lipschitz constant of U, right? This UR is just, I mean, the graph of UR is just a nomotity of the graph of U. So if U was, was area minimizing, then UR is also area minimizing. The Lipschitz constant stays the same, and this excess is scaled by this power in such a way that here in this emotity, I transform balls of a certain radius into balls of a certain other radius, so the excess on the corresponding balls stays the same. Okay, so let me just summarize this discussion in the following. So both the Lipschitz constant the area minimizing property and the excess are invariant under these scaling and translating. So this means any time that I will have a statement on some ball of radius r centered on point p, I can actually apply this idea and get back a statement on the ball of radius 1 centered at 0. Okay? And this will simply simplify uh, 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 a lot of computations. OK, and then there is another uh, couple of uh, uh, elementary remarks that I want to make. So another elementary remark is the following. So if I so if I have a ball of radius r, so if I fix an optimal plane, so fix a pi such that your excess is the optimal here. Okay, and now take a smaller ball. Say, take a B row Q, which is contained in BRP. Okay, now I, I, can, I can simply make the following uh, comparison. So I can say the overall excess of sigma in the ball of radius rho and centered at Q is of course less or equal, since here I'm optimizing over all planes pi, than the excess with respect to that particular plane. Okay, and now since in the, de in the definition I have an integral, right, if I look at the excess in the ball of radius r centered at p, which contains the ball of radius rho centered at q, well, the integral can only become larger. But then, of course, I have a normalizing factor, and I'm paying that normalizing factor. So I can write here a very simple inequality which tells me, OK, this is then less or equal than r to the m divided by rho to the m. And then here, I will have the excess in the larger ball. with respect to this plane pi. But then this one is the optimal plane, so of course I have this inequality. OK, so now with very similar arguments, you can actually get other similar comparisons. And let me just state a proposition here. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Here. So this is a proposition that I leave you as an exercise, uh, and it will be used uh, very often. 
So, so U is a map from omega into Rm. The Lipschitz constant is less or equal than two, and you have a point P, which is equal to x U of x. And then another point Q, which is equal to y, u of y. Okay, so then there are constants, c1, c2, c3, these are all geometric constants and you have the following facts. So first of all, you can make a lower and upper bound with respect to r to the m of the volume of the graph of u in any ball centered at p Uh, should map into Rn, yes. And that is going to be true for every ball which is contained in the cylinder. So the total volume that you have on the ball, given that you have a Lipschitz constant bound, is controlled from above and from below by the total volume of the unit disk or of the disk of radius r. Okay, now you can use that. So you can use this first very elementary remark to actually have the following control. So I can measure the distance between two planes with the excess on of sigma in the ball of radius 2rp, uh, okay, so that's the graph of u, on b2rp with respect to pi 1 plus the excess Uh, of the graph of u on b rho of p with respect to pi 2. And this, provided I have that the ball of radius rho is in between the ball of radius 2r and the, the, ball, the ball of radius uh, r. And then, of course, I have to be less or equal than the distance between the point x and omega. So this is simply telling you if this excess is small and this excess is small, it's not possible actually that the two planes are too tilted, right? And then finally, Another very similar uh, uh, estimate. So again for pi 1 and pi 2, but this time I'm actually changing the, the central points. So I can also say pi 1 minus pi 2 squared is certainly less or equal, and here I will have a constant C3. And then I can put the excess of the graph on a certain ball, so it's BRP with respect to pi 1, and then the excess of the graph of U again in the same ball with respect to pi 2, uh, sorry, not in the same ball, but in, 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 uh, in this other point that I have over here. And that as long as the distance between Q and P is comparable, so in fact we will need it in the following situation, is equal to R, and of course again, the distance between Q and the boundary of omega, yeah, here it was always the boundary of omega actually. Uh -huh. Yeah. Distance between X and the boundary of omega 
and the distance between y and the boundary of omega is both, both time less than r. Okay? So let me just give you a very uh, uh, Just a very simple explanation of 30 seconds and then we finish this lecture. So, so what is the first estimate coming from? Well, the first estimate is, 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 is uh, here, over here, is coming from the fact that the ball is contained in the respective cylinder, right? The Lipschitz constant is under control and then in the respective cylinder, somehow the projection down is a disk of volume omega m r to the power m, and you know, over you have a Lipschitz graph, the area cannot become much larger. Where is, where is the second bound actually coming from? Well, the second bound is coming from the following fact. So if I take a ball of reduce r, here I have a central point, and here I have my Lipschitz graph, right? Well, certainly there will be another cylinder which is slightly smaller, maybe of radius b of r divided by 2. And the Lipschitz graph over this cylinder is entirely contained inside the ball, okay? And the projection of this cylinder down is going to be the disk. So possibly this constant over here, you can actually compute it as like 1 over 2 to the power m. Professor? Yes? Do you want r to be less than the distance? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Sorry. Right. And then when is this uh, comparison here coming from? Well, for instance, let us take the second estimate. So the second estimate, I could simply say the following. So take the intersection between BRP and BRQ intersected with your graph of U. By the first estimate, this is certainly bigger or equal than some constant times some r to the power m. OK? OK, and then if I average p1 minus p2 squared over here, right, uh, I divide by this constant, I will discover that this one controls pi1 minus pi2 squared. And here I have 1 over a constant r to the power m, OK? Now, I, I, with the triangle inequality, I sneak in the tangent to your graph. So I take pi 1 minus the tangent to the graph and square it. Of course, I do the same with pi 2. And square it. And then here I'm integrating on this intersection. Instead of integrating into intersection, I integrate once on the ball of reduce r centered at p, and the other times on the ball of reduce r centered at q. Okay? And then I get the excess with respect to pi 2 and the excess with respect to pi 1. Well, in the excess, I was, dif I was dividing by 1 over 2. I mean, I was dividing by 2. Here I'm dividing by some constant. So then you actually get the constant that you have over here. Tomorrow we uh, start over and then. Um, Go on.